Hello everybody, this is our third lecture and in this lecture we will continue process modeling so it will be part two of process modeling. So I would like to start the lecture with an overview of the course. As I mentioned, we start with the modeling of a process and this is where we are at the moment. Then based on the model of the process, we either perform a steady state analysis or dynamic analysis, which are based on a steady state and transient equations of the system. And once we have an understanding of the equations of the system, we can perform process control and process optimization. In parallel with this, we have basically two types of system, either linear or nonlinear. And by adding nonlinearity to the system, it just makes the equations more complex because this nonlinearity will be carried forward to the equation. So in case of linear processes, we only have algebraic equations and linear ODEs. But for nonlinear systems, we will end up producing nonlinear algebraic equations or nonlinear ODEs. And then when we start solving these equations, if the system and equations are linear, there's a good chance that we can solve them analytically. But in most cases, if the system is nonlinear, we end up using numerical approximation for algebraic or ODE uh, equations. So again, for process modeling, we use uh, conservation laws, which in the general form, it is these equations, and we discussed this in the previous session, and we also derive the conservation of mass and conservation of component for a simple example of a stair tank blending process. In this session, we will drive the conservation of energy for a similar process, except that in here we will have heating. So it's a stair tank heating process. We will have one liquid into the system and uh, basically a bunch of assumptions. Let's establish these assumptions before we go forward and drive the equation. So the first assumption that we have is mixing is perfect. So because we have one liquid, it just means that there is no gradient of temperature within the tank and the temperature of liquid inside the tank and the temperature of liquid discharging uh, the tank are the same. The liquid holdup is constant, which means that we will have same amount of liquid within the tank. <coughs> and then the, the assumption three is basically we have constant properties for the liquid, including density and heat capacity. And finally, assumption four is that there are no heat losses. So we can assume that all the valves are insulated and there is no heat transfer from the top of the tank to the atmosphere. Now we can start driving the conservation of energy. For that, I would rewrite the general form of conservation law for energy, which says basically that the rate of accumulation of energy is equal to rate of energy into the system plus rate of energy out of the system excuse me this is minus plus rate of generation of energy we can here call it addition of energy to the system minus rate of consumption of energy or in here we can call it removal of energy from the system. So to make it easier, I will just redraw the 
a sketch of our problem which is a stair tank with only one inlet which is one fluid at the flow rate of w1 and temperature of t1 there is an agitator and there is one uh, outlet at the flow rate of w and temperature of t and we assume that it's a perfect mixing so temperature inside the tank is also t and we have constant density and the total volume which is also constant is v we also have an electrical heater in here which provides basically heat to the system so before we start writing the equation we have to establish some uh, items in here first of all let me clarify these terms so these first two terms are basically input and output of energy to the system by means of convection when i say convection i mean that energy is basically is input to the system and is extracted from the system by flow of matter whereas the other terms on the right hand side basically these two terms are addition and removal of energy to the system or from the system by means of work or heat transfer and just to explain these two let's imagine that uh, for a spinning of this agitator within the tank we have to overcome the friction of liquid and the resistance of liquid against the impeller so we have to do some work which is the work done by the motor of this agitator and this work will be basically transferred to the liquid within the tank and it may transfer to the another form of energy it could be just dissipation to uh, heat and just increase the temperature of the liquid slightly but anyways there is a there is an energy that is added to the system but in most of the problems that we will consider in this course this work is negligible we can also have uh, work extracted from the system and that could be just by having a turbine that is basically run by the flow and in that case the energy will be extracted from the system but the term that is mostly used in this course is heat transfer so if heat is transferred to the system it will be of positive sign and if heat is extracted from the system for example if this instead of this uh, electrical coil if we had a uh, tube and we had cooling water running through that tube you would extract the heat from the system and it would appear with a negative sign in the equation the other item that we have to consider is the definition of energy so for any matter the total energy is summation of internal energy and kinetic energy and potential energy internal energy is the energy of molecules whereas kinetic energy and potential energy these are the energy of bulk of material so molecules they move and they uh, vibrate and they have all sorts of energies due to temperature and pressure but when we talk about kinetic energy and potential energy these are the energy of bulk of material so if we have a uh, we, if we have a flow of a fluid at a certain velocity the kinetic energy of that flow is uh, proportional to the velocity and um, in the same manner if we have a liquid which is at a certain elevation the potential energy of that liquid or, or that flow of liquid is proportion to the elevation of the bulk of material again in this course these are normally negligible 
So we are mostly concerned with the internal energy. Now we can write the internal energy based on the internal energy per unit mass of the liquid and then at this point we can start filling the equation of the conservation of energy which is d m times u hat int by dt is equal to energy into the system by convection which is w1 times <coughs> you had internal at the inlet minus energy that is leaving the system by convection which is w times you had internal uh, plus any addition of energy by heat or by work which is q in this case minus any removal of energy by work or by heat which is zero in this case so now i just remind you of our assumptions that this uh, system is in a steady state condition in terms of flow rate so w1 is actually equal to w so i can <coughs> and also i can uh, take this term out of the derivative and replace it by rho v so then i would have rho v du at internal over dt is equal to and i can factor w w times u at internal at the inlet minus u had internal plus q now at this stage I have to go slightly off the topic just to refresh ourselves about a thermodynamic relation between internal energy and enthalpy and heat capacity. So let's just change the color in here and make a blue line just to differentiate it from the main topic. So we know that for liquids and solids internal energy or internal energy per unit mass is equal to enthalpy of matter or enthalpy of matter per unit mass which is a function of temperature and pressure as a result if i just slightly change the internal energy so d u internal is equal to dh and using the chain rule i can write it as del h over del t at constant pressure times dt plus del h over del p at constant temperature times dp and again i remind you that for liquids and solid variation of enthalpy with respect to pressure is negligible so we can basically uh, remove this term and what is left is du internal is equal to dh and again this term is heat capacity at constant pressure so 
this is C P D T. And if I take the integral of the two sides of this equation, I would have delta u internal is equal to C P delta T. So these are the two equations that we need. So now let's get back to our main topic. I will just change the color back to black so I can continue the main topic. And let's just uh, substitute these into our the final form of uh, energy balance that we have in here. So if I put du uh, based on CPDT, I would have rho v CP dt over dt which is equal to u times delta u internal basically which now i can use the second equation and write it in terms of heat capacity and temperature difference from inlet to outlet and finally i have heat transfer to the system so this will be the final form of conservation of energy. Well, let's close this lecture with one last topic and that's the degrees of freedom analysis. This analysis ensures that the model equations are solvable. The requirement for the solvability of equations is that the number of unknown variables must be equal to the number of independent model equations. In other words, all of the available degrees of freedom must be utilized. So to know how many degrees of freedom are available in the system, we use this equation, which basically relates the number of degrees of freedom to the number of unknown variables minus number of independent equations. If uh, NF ends up being zero, that means the model is exactly specified and there is a solution for the system. If NF is larger than zero, then the model is underspecified and there are infinite solutions for the system. And if NF is less than zero, the model is over-specified and there is basically no solution for the system. Now let's implement this analysis to the stair tank heating process that we just uh, solved. For this problem, there are parameters which are constant and are given. So these are basically out of equation. There are four unknown variables, temperature at the inlet, heat transfer rate, flow rate, and temperature at the discharge. So NV is equal to four. And there is only one equation and that's the energy balance. So NE is one. And so the number of degrees of freedom is three, which means the system is under specified and there are infinite solutions for the model. But with some changes, we can make this system solvable. And that's if we specify three of the variables as input variables and specify their values or their functionality of the time and only leave one of the variables as the output variable of the system or of the model. In that case, the number of variables will be reduced to one and the number of degrees of freedom will be zero. So the system will be exactly specified and we can find a solution for that system.